Ever since Netflix signed an exclusive deal with Nickelodeon, one question has loomed on everybody's mind. When will Avatar The Last Airbender finally drop on Netflix, at least in the US? Well, after a long wait, it finally hits the streaming service this week, so let's talk about it. Hey everybody and welcome back to The Sandbox. Today is going to be a very special ranking video on all seven seasons of the Avatar universe, including all four seasons of The Legend of Korra. I am not exaggerating when I say that Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the best shows out there despite it being a Nickelodeon cartoon. It's one of the best shows for its medium with beautiful animation, a diverse Asiatic world, a uniquely brilliant yet simple magic system, and some of the best written characters to ever hit the screen. It's one of three shows that have heavily influenced the story that I am currently working on, and I grew up watching this show in anticipation of every episode, so this one is very special to me. So without further ado, here's my ranking of all seven seasons of the Avatarverse. Starting at the bottom is one that I think everyone in the fan community can agree on, and that's The Legend of Korra Season 2 Spirits. Now before I address its shortcomings, I'd like to note that every season in the Avatar universe is pretty good. None I would say are bad or unenjoyable, but the ones at the top are truly god tier. And the one that falls the most flat is definitely season 2 of Korra. Now this season actually has one of my favorite episodes, that being part 1 and 2 of Beginnings, which finally gives us the story of the first Avatar, Wan, and how he came to be. I was always so interested to learn the lore behind the Avatar, and this two part episode did not disappoint, and it truly got me invested in the season afterwards. The problem is, it's halfway through the season. The first half feels convoluted and messy, and even after all it's set up, it just feels boring. Now the season gets started in an interesting way by seeing the spirits starting to act up and become hostile, which Unalak, the big bad for the season, uses to start his manipulation over Korra. But after that, the season sees civil issues between Korra's people, Bo Lin becoming a movie star, and Mako doing some police work. It's just not what us fans expect out of this type of show. And Unalak himself as a villain wasn't bad, it just again felt boring. I mean, we had seen a villainous waterbender, aka bloodbender Tarlock, in the season right before. In the end, what we get from all this setup and confusing, separated plot lines is a bit of a jumbled mess that barely finds its footing in the end. It's the most important one to watch for the series, but the least enjoyable one to do so. Next up I have the first season of Avatar, Water. Now this season is a fun, endearing journey of Aang going to the Northern Water Tribe so that he can learn waterbending. Of course in the end he learns Katara is meant to be his waterbending teacher after all this time. Now not every episode is connected to this overarching plot as they make stops along the way such as going penguin sledding and riding elephant koi. However each episode gives a valuable lesson for kids such as burying the hatchet for the sake of unity and knowing the difference between right and wrong even during hard times. Every episode works hard to help develop our characters as we watch them grow as people and as benders, or warriors for Sokka's sake. Good try, but now. The only thing that holds this season back is that it is the most kid-friendly season, as the show was designed for kids, being a Nickelodeon show and all. However, after Nick saw the potential for this show with this season, I think they definitely allowed for the showrunners to up the ante a bit. Now that's not to say this season was too childish. Episodes like The Storm and The Blue Spirit really show how powerful this kid's show can be. But I also think this first season suffers the most of too many one-off episodes that don't tie into the overarching story, and we really don't see Aang learn waterbending except for the one time he practices with Katara, of course until the end when they finally arrive to the Northern Water Tribe and meet Master Paku. Overall, this first season is a great introduction to the world, the characters, and the story, but it can't compare to the seasons that follow. Next up is The Legend of Korra Season 4, Balance. Now overall I think this season was a pretty solid ending for Korra. It left us with sweet sentiments and showed us that Korra's hot-headedness would indeed dissipate with time. It had some of the best and some of the worst animation in the series. I'm sorry but those mech suits just didn't do it for me. 
This season really digs a hole for Korra to climb out of, and no earthbending allowed. She really suffers, and at times it can feel like her character does as well, but at the same time, a lot of it feels necessary for her growth as the Avatar. This season she goes up against many difficult trials, but the big bad this time is the fascist leader Kuvira, who is a wicked metal bender. I wish they had spent more time to develop her backstory and give her some pathos, but really most of the time Kuvira was just your typical bad guy for the sake of bad. She did think she was doing the best thing for her people, but it's not until the very end when Korra defeats her and then saves her that she realizes she's been wrong. Now even though this season gives us some pretty big highs and very big lows for our characters, one thing remains constant, this season's itching desire to keep Korra down in that hole. It just feels like they were trying way too hard to make her weak from her scars inflicted by Zaheer and the Red Lotus. Now it makes sense because, let's be honest, Korra normally would wipe the floor with Kuvira, but instead of upping the ante with Kuvira by giving her a backstory or buffing up her power levels to strengthen the season's potential, they instead chose to nerf down Korra and keep her constantly battered down. Maybe it was just an excuse to throw in Toph to mentor Korra for an episode, I'm not sure. But after what Korra went through, especially in Season 2, Kuvira just seems like her typical sandbox bully. That's <laughs> too bad I did there. Next up on my list right in the middle is Korra Season 1 Air. Now this was a fantastic start for The Legend of Korra. It further built the world given to us in Avatar, developing Republic City, and the new challenges for the next Avatar, after all what Aang was able to do during his time. I think Amon and the Equalists were a very interesting and scary villainous group that was always able to outsmart Korra due to her notable hot-headedness. The whole season is set up by showing this flaw in Korra by her difficulty in learning airbending. Now usually for a water tribe avatar, firebending would be the most difficult to learn and vice versa as we heard from Avatar Roku, and earth and air were opposites as we saw with Aang himself. But Korra never had a hard time with fire. Her character is always about charging in the battle and using that passion to win, which is exactly what Amon uses to make calculated moves against Korra. Now the thing I loved most about this season was definitely its world building off of what Avatar gave us, the use of bloodbending as a story tool for the villains, and the progress that steelbending has made were very cool to see. The whole season has this sort of noir tone, and personally, I think Amon is my favorite big bad in the Korra series. But right above Season 1 of Korra, I have Season 3, Change. This is definitely the fan favorite amongst the Korra community, and for good reason. It's the closest the show ever gets to Avatar, with its exciting and straightforward plotline, awesome animation, interesting philosophy, and tons of epic Avatar world action. Plus, the season shows true growth for Korra, where she finally chooses self-sacrifice instead of battle, and empowering others over her own sense of adventure. Zaheer and his bandits of the Red Lotus are powerful, intense, and scary. They believe the natural state of the world is chaos, and they want to help re-achieve that. And sometimes the hardest parts for Korra isn't fighting Zaheer, but questioning whether he's right or not. This season fixes outlying issues from the ones before it, and it sets up the final season of Korra very well. It's definitely the best that Korra has ever been. However, above it, at number two, I have Avatar The Last Airbender Season 3 Fire. This season is just amazing. It's focused, intense, hilarious, chilling, surprising, epic. It's as good as a finale season can be for a show, with the invasion of the Day of Black Sun, the rescue mission at the Boiling Rock Prison, and the inevitable showdown during Shozen's Comet. While Aang definitely steals a spotlight during most of this season, I find that he struggles to do so, going up against the likes of Sokka, Katara, and Zuko. Zuko's transformation is finally realized in this season, and it is epic. You've heard me talk about it before on this channel, but Zuko's character arc is tremendously awesome and sad at the same time. You really feel for this guy, who you have every right to hate, but watching him grow throughout this series thanks to his experience against his father and growth with Uncle Iroh makes you realize that he's just a byproduct of his history. We all are. But our shortcomings will never define who we are in the end. Our mistakes don't have to control our destiny. We can always rise up and overcome them. Iroh knew Zuko had lost his way, and while he never forced him back, he was always constantly nudging him back in the right direction. I think Sokka is at his best in this season. He's hilarious and really shows true promise as a leader. He does a lot this season from his journey to the Boiling Rock with Zuko to his warpath on an airship. And meanwhile, Katara goes through a huge transformation this season from becoming the Painted Lady to finally coming to terms with her mom's death. 
Honestly, besides Fire Lord Ozai, I think Katara is the most terrifying character in this season. There are times where she is truly sinister, but it's all necessary so that she can come to grips with her mom's death and forgive Zuko in the end. The animation, the music, the character arc conclusions, and the awesome bending action make this season truly a classic. However, none of it would be possible if it weren't for Avatar Season 2, Earth, which I have at the top of my list. This season is a complete exploration of each character's philosophy and inner conflicts. The additions of Toph and Azula as main characters further strengthen the show's dynamics and make for some thrilling and hilarious interactions and combinations. This season is much more focused than season one for the overarching plot at hand, and while the season still has one-off episodes, each one feels more impactful and significant for these certain plot lines and arcs. Zuko alone is a huge turning point for Zuko's character that's an awesome deep dive into his inner struggle and fleshes out more of his backstory. Appa's Lost Days is probably the most powerful and emotional episode of the series for me, showing us just what Appa had to go through while he was separated from Team Avatar. Episodes like these, along with Tales of Bob Sing Say really allow us to understand each and every character, their goals and aspirations, their motivation, their ideologies, and their struggles. Probably most memorable for me is the episode Bitter Work. I truly love this episode since it shows us just how connected these four forms of bending are. Iroh uses water bending techniques to teach Zuko how to redirect lightning, a technique Iroh hopes Zuko will never have to use. That along with watching Aang struggle with earth bending as it goes against his very nature makes this episode remarkable in my eyes. Plus Sokka is absolutely hilarious in this episode, getting stuck in a ditch and befriending his would-be dinner. Well, that's my ranking of all seven seasons of the Avatarverse. Let me know down in the comments below if you're excited for its release on Netflix, and what are your favorite episodes and seasons? Also, if you could be a bender of the elements, what would you choose? I love how they've designed each different form to have its own advantages. Some powerful airbenders gain the ability to fly, waterbenders can manipulate ice, water particles in the air, and even blood. Earthbenders can bend sand, mud, lava, and even steel, and firebenders can learn control over lightning, and some become combustion benders. Anyways, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy the video. I'll see you all next time. My first girlfriend turned into the moon. That's rough, buddy.